Welcome to episode 19 of More Than Just Maps. I'm your host, Ollie Powers. This podcast was created with the intent to help anyone in the GIS field get from where they are now to where they want to be, be that your first job, a career move, or just improving your GIS game overall. On this week's episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Brett Clark of NearMap. Brett started his foray into the geospatial industry in a slightly non-traditional manner, construction. After a series of decisions saw him then go from advertising to sales, Brett landed a sales role as one of the first employees for Australian-based NearMap in the U.S. Now the North American Public Sector Director, Brett shares what it took to get to where he is now and how NearMap is impacting the geospatial industry on this side of the globe. And now for part one of my interview with Brett Clark. Welcome to the latest episode of More Than Just Maps. Today, my guest is Brett Clark of NearMap. He's the director for the public sector of North America. Welcome, Brett. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm really glad we could have you on. Let's get started and dive into your to your background, how you got into, into NearMap. Um, let's, but let's start at the beginning first, before you got to NearMap. How, how did you get into the industry as we know it now? Yeah, absolutely. So my interest in GIS, I, unbeknownst to me at the time, <laughs> started uh, when I was very young. Uh, my dad loved to take road trips. And uh, while he, he tried to stay on top of technology, he always deferred to those massive like 18 by 14 inch atlases when we would travel on road trips. And I think uh, everybody's I guess, dad did that. <laughs> not, right? Seriously. And so the, the trade-off for being the quote unquote navigator was I, I had direct access to the snacks that he had in the, uh, <laughs> the driver's uh, seat. So I would sit next to my dad <clears throat> and I would be combing through that atlas and he'd say, he, he would teach me how to read a map, you know, looking at, uh, mile markers or exit numbers, uh, learning interstates and, and all those things. And still to this day, I can sit down with him and say, yeah, you know, I, I'm thinking of driving. I, I live in Indianapolis. Uh, I'm thinking of going down to Tampa. Oh, you want to take I-60, whatever, and then junction here and do all that. And so he's, he just was always like that. And so uh, very much maps were part of my life growing up. Uh, it wasn't until after college that uh, I looked to pivot my career at the time from marketing and advertising uh, to sales. And uh, I had so, played okay. rugby. I'm going to okay. squeeze in there. So um, so why did you choose marketing and advertising first? Great question, because I actually started as a construction management major. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so kind of been all over. Uh, you know, to be honest, uh, I had always loved engaging with people. And on a whim to fulfill uh, an English credit or something like that, I can't remember why, I took an intro to advertising class. I can still remember Comms 230. And we sat down and we watched a clip the very first day. The teacher said, if you want kind of a basic idea of what advertising is, I think this is a great clip. And he pulled up uh, the clip from Mad Men, uh, that, that show from AMC, which is great. Uh, which I came to love and, and watch. And I had never seen it at the time. And it, it has Don Draper talking to the guys at Kodak about their little, uh, what became known as the carousel, but it was a wheel that had slides and you could press a button, it would pop the slides in and out so you could view them very easily. And uh, it just inspired me. I, I just was like, this is my calling. It, it was almost on the level of like a spiritual experience. Uh, I thought, okay. I am definitely not meant to be a construction management major. Okay. <laughs> uh, this, this is more in line with what I want to do. And so I, after that class, I had probably a two hour break in between that and my next class. And I walked over to the admissions building and I changed my major. Uh, so that, that got me down the path of marketing and advertising. And as I went through it, I, I enjoyed it. I loved what I was doing, but I, I quickly realized two things. One, I want to interact with people a lot more. Uh, and two, uh, I want to be able to have, you know, my ability to provide a better life be more mathematical rather mm -hmm. than based on someone else's opinion, which simply means the more effort I put in, the more output I can expect. Yeah. Uh, and so that eventually led me to sales, okay. uh, where it's, you know, I can push 
really hard. I can work really hard. And that will eventually the sales gods will smile on me. (laughs) You know, we can, we can uh, provide better for the family. So an old rugby buddy of mine from Mm -hmm. college said, I have a friend who is looking to start up a sales team for this mapping company. And they're out of Australia, but they're setting up an office in Salt Lake City, which is around where I lived at the time. And I said, I said, okay, I've always liked maps. Uh, sure, let's let's talk to them. And uh, that was near map. Okay. And that was five and a half years ago. And so I started as a junior level inside salesperson, one of eight people in all of near map US. Uh, at the time, I basically, I called them dribble cages, but we had uh, <laughs> these little cubes that were maybe two and a half feet wide by a foot and a half deep. Uh, I'm a rather large person, uh, mm-hmm. and so I, I felt kind of like Mr. Incredible in his car, uh, yeah. spilling out of my <laughs> desk, uh, you know, making calls and talking to people about things that I, I really didn't know. And I, I have to just give a general thank you to the GIS community for being patient with me, but also answering a lot of my questions, because oftentimes I would go in and, and ask they'd say a term, you know, what is this in web Mercator or what's your projection? I'd say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Can you please enlighten me on what you mean? <laughs> and, uh, and they were great at explaining it. And uh, I really came to develop a passion for GIS in general, but also aerial imagery. So that was my, my path to near map. It was a, a long and winding road. Okay, cool. Um, so what are you doing these days in well okay so you started as sales in your map mm-hmm. um yeah. and today you're you're the director um so can you talk a little bit more about how you that path from from sales to director went sure yeah absolutely so as anyone that has been following near map for the past few years can attest we've grown up a lot in a lot of ways uh it, it used to be um we kind of came in with the australian mindset that you know, this worked well over here, so we're just going to copy and paste here in the U.S. And that's not, that's proven to be a, a not the best approach. And we've learned <laughs> from that, <laughs> you know, yeah. and we we pivoted uh, quite a bit. And so in sales, I quickly learned coming into NearMap at the outset, local government uh, knows a lot about this industry and they're a prime focus for us. And so much of my effort was spent around reaching out to counties and cities, towns, special districts, you know, you, you name it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, I feel like, gave me a great crash course in the industry. And so as I progressed, uh, and being, you know, in the early days, uh, you kind of start to build tenure, was able to have some success uh, year over year, and was able to grow uh, within the business, became a senior account uh, executive, managing kind of those larger uh, scale accounts, more complex, uh, and then just continued to build that. But all the while, uh, as anyone who knows me well enough can also attest, uh, you're going to know what I'm thinking and how I feel. Uh, I'm I'm not, uh, and, and pardon the analogy, I have three small daughters, but I'm definitely not Elsa from Frozen. I don't conceal <laughs> Uh, very well my feelings I definitely (laughs) let I let it go (laughs) Um, and and I I express my thoughts and and what that means is within within our own business I said look you know I try to be a strong voice and proponent for positive change especially when it came to licensing how we approach the market our product development etc and so that leadership eventually uh, paved the way combined with you know some some sales success uh, to lead out the government space uh, and lead our public sector team. Okay. And yeah, and, and so that officially came uh, into play just in July. So that's when I began officially as the as the director for our public sector here in North America. Okay, so you're still you're still a little bit new to the to the director position, but you've got a little bit of time under your belt. So you mentioned that the, the copy and paste method from Australia to the US wasn't working. Um, <laughs> right. Can you, can you dig a little bit more into that? Because I think that's interesting. I When I went to Australia when I was still in my undergrad, which was fantastic. And if anybody can go to Australia, I would definitely recommend it. So much fun there. Um, but they kept, they kept um, 
saying, oh, oh, you're from Canada. I'm actually from Canada. Uh, oh, you're from Canada. So Australia is like the US and New Zealand is like the Canada of the Southern Hemisphere. You say it didn't work, but are there similarities between Australia and US and the US that do work or, or what was actually going on there that, that just wasn't working? Sure. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I can certainly expound on that. So in general, the Australian economy is much smaller than the US. That's, that's just a statement. I have to be cognizant that if any of my Australian brethren or sisters listen to this, I want to not <laughs> misspeak. But, uh, but no, they basically near map uh, over in Australia has the same dominance uh, as Esri does, for example, globally. Right? It's just, that's, that's de facto GIS system. And in Australia, aerial imagery, you, you get that from near map. That's just kind of what you do. You know? okay. It's that commonplace, uh, relatively speaking, obviously within the industry. Uh, so there was a very well-established business. It's a public company there. So we, we do have us, you know, shareholders and a board and everything like that uh, on the ASX, the Australian Stock Exchange. So it was a well-oiled machine. Well, in the United States, no one knew who we were five and a half years ago when I started. I just had to spend time helping people pronounce the name right. Uh, you know, I didn't and, think it was uh, that hard. How, how were people <laughs> trying to pronounce it? <laughs> well, it was just so foreign, you know, they're like, wait mirror map what no it's an n like yeah like nancy uh so you know it, it took some time but we were such uh we were new and, and the u.s for us was very much like the wild wild west you know virgin territory in a lot of ways we're stepping into places that have had relationships with, with an existing provider you know or, or providers that have been going on for you know a decade and a half and you have this new upstart company coming in saying we have a totally new way of doing things and to be honest the australians were onto something because near map is quite innovative what they identified is kind of two key parts we can build way more effective uh, aerial imagery camera systems mm -hmm. and we can have a very innovative business model and when you combine those that's really the value that NearMap brings. Our chief engineer at the time, who's since retired from the business, he was the third most patented person that are alive ever. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, held many, many patents. And many of those dealt with camera systems and things like that. And so we hold a lot of patents around the ability to fly at much higher altitudes, but maintain the same resolution as you would get uh, from fixed wing aircraft, which we also fly uh, at much lower altitudes. And so that's, that's actually that's the, really neat. Yeah. So are you guys, I'm assuming it's going to be digital photography that you guys are doing, correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. actually had a course when I was doing my, my graduate work um, for remote sensing. This guy just wanted us to have the history. Um, so we actually were, he was going way back to, to film aerial photography. And like, we had to know all the different layers of film and all, and all these crazy things. We're like, how is this helping us now? Everything is what? digital. <laughs> um, it was really cool to learn that stuff. But at the same time, it's the industry is progressing to, to what you've got now. So exactly. And I, and I know this is probably trade secrets, but how are your cameras different than, than regular cameras? Um, because I remember you, uh, I think it was you who had done a presentation that I was listening to for uh, somewhere. And you, you guys did mention that you, that you created your own cameras, that you did your own lenses. Everything is in house with, with you guys, which Correct. I had no idea at the time. Um, I, I had heard of, I'd used near map before I'd heard of it, used it before I knew it was a pretty good product, but I was kind of blown away by just the amount of self-sufficiency that near map has for itself you're not you're not outsourcing things nope. so you mentioned that you can fly higher and keep the same resolution um but what else is, are your systems doing sure yeah yeah and i can go into that with some detail without giving away the 11 herbs and spices uh, <laughs> okay. of near map <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> uh, so you're you're absolutely right so from a technical perspective it's not the camera system really that's the most unique. What what our I would argue is our most valuable patent is what we call hypervision, and that is our proprietary 
uh, and patented ability to rapidly orthorectify and georeference uh, imagery and to do almost 100% automated uh, orthorectification. So we can take terabytes of data and process uh, full color digital aerial imagery that's completely georeferenced uh, and orthorectified in a matter of a few hours. So we can take, you know, about 1,500 to let's say 3,000 square miles of data and churn that out in a matter of hours rather than months, which is the standard industry uh, turnaround time. Yeah, which is just I, blowing my mind because understanding <laughs> the processing behind all that stuff and, and having done just images that we used, uh, one of the places I used to work, we had a drone, so we'd process our own images and just understanding even just those images that were for a small area, the amount of computer power, the amount of time we needed for that, the fact that you guys can do that in hours is insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it, it is very unique, uh, you know, and, and then the only, we have two major delays that usually happen within that processing timeline. One is simply getting the raw data files from the, the belly of the plane to the mm -hmm. processing center. That's, okay. that's the longest delay. And the second is for doing generic QA, QC throughout standard areas in every survey and collection, which is done uh, in-house as well by, by our staff. But it, it is quite rapid. So after I think it was Hurricane Matthew, that came through on a Thursday. Luckily, that was a very, well, not luckily, but for us, uh, <laughs> yeah. it was a very wind-based hurricane. And so Friday morning was bright, crisp, clear. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got out, flew Friday morning through kind of the key hours of the day, yeah. and then sent that data off. And we were able to process ortho imagery, oblique imagery, and 3D data, which we collect. Uh, and it was live by about 1 a.m. Saturday morning. Oh my so it was gosh. about a 14 hour turnaround time. That, um, that is and, incredible. Yeah, yeah, that was the full content stack. Uh, and so that's that ability to chunk through a lot of that data is pretty amazing. You know, our, our camera systems, we do build them in house. We do not buy generic things like a, a Leica system or a Vexel camera. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our, we have a whole floor in our office tower in uh, the Barangaroo uh, area of Sydney that is dedicated to uh, camera construction engineering. And so there's parts laying everywhere and all these things. Uh, you know, we, we have some machinery or something that allows us to actually polish the lenses and the mirrors that we use in the system. Uh, but they're all custom built uh, by our team in Australia. And so that makes it completely proprietary. The other unique aspect of what we do is that while we own the camera system and the guidance systems, we do not uh, own planes or pilots. And that's by design. We work with large national or you know, large regional providers okay. to uh, then take our proprietary systems, but put them in any plane that we need to. What that allows us to do is dramatically reduce cost and risk. Because if it still happens that you know, this pilot has a tummy ache or this plane is broken, that's not our plane in our fleet. We can say, okay, and we have one of our engineers pull our, you know, our, our proprietary systems out of that plane that's broken and they put it in another one. Or we get another pilot to go fly it. Uh, and what that allows us to do is respond very rapidly to events and hit those optimal days uh, without having uh, the, the baked in risk that comes from owning your own uh, fleet or employing, you know, full-time pilots that are, that are on the payroll. So that, that adds a level of flexibility as well. Then you combine that with a very unique business model, which the, the cheesy analogy I use is the famous line from the movie Field of Dreams. Are you familiar with that? Movie? I'm not, no. Or the, you probably know the quote, you know, okay. if you build it, they will come. Yes, yes. That's the, the famous line from that movie, right? That is that is the best way I can think to succinctly in a nutshell describe Near Maps business model. If we fly an area proactively, they, meaning customers, be they GIS or engineering or construction or insurance or real estate, what have you, they will come because they will see the value and having access to that data set. And so 
uh, we proactively fly over 430 uh, massive urban areas, anywhere from one to three times per year throughout just the U.S. We do several dozen up in Canada as well, uh, here in North America. That's completely unique, and it, and it changes the industry. So going back to your original question about you know, Australia versus the U.S. Or, or North America and how that was different, yeah. uh, that was very innovative. Because if we're being honest in the U.S., what we were doing was we're going to put out an RFP, which no one likes to do. Let's be real. You're yep. not going to deceive me. No one likes writing them. No one likes responding to them. And they certainly don't like sifting through them. But nope. su- such is our life. <laughs> uh, and so it was, let's put out an RFP. Someone will go fly. But the cost is so massive, sometimes hundreds of dollars a square mile. That to offset that cost, many counties or regions or even cities say, you know what, we're going to sacrifice the quality of data to just afford it. And what I mean by that is we're going to fly, you know, once every three years yeah. and sign in some long six-year contract where we're only getting two captures. But because the cost is so extreme, we still have to shell out 100K, 200K a year just to afford that. Mm-hmm. That's insane. <laughs> yeah, uh, that that's that's crazy, especially with the innovations in the market. And so, if and especially you especially follow... also just the processing time, you'll fly it in yeah. at the yeah. beginning of the year, and you probably won't get that data till the end of that year. And by that point, a lot has already changed that from the images that were originally taken. Yeah, I to that point, I have a good friend uh, that I have known for years. He's one of the first people I I reached out to when I started at Near Map. Uh, his name's Keith Caldwell. Uh, he's in the GIS, lead the GIS team up in Lake County, Illinois. Uh, and he told me, he said, we got flown by an existing provider and I think it was March or April. And he said, Brett, I remember being at the Christmas party that year and someone said, hey, we got the initial data delivery from the, uh, the flight and thinking that that was pretty cool and that was pretty fast. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that's 10 months later. Yeah. That's insane. You know, we process, we can get uh, just with all the different surveys we're doing. We usually say we post images within about five to 10 business days after collection, Mm -hmm. uh, just because we're doing so many of them. Uh, And that gives us, and our lawyers like us to give that kind of time frame to be safe. (laughs) (laughs) But no, we we can process it still very rapidly in in a matter of getting it uploaded and ready within those few days versus 10 months. And and so it is uh, kind of crazy. But if you, as another analogy, if you track the evolution of how we buy music, you know, it used to be we get records. Yeah. And then it became cassette tapes and CDs and things really hadn't changed. It was just the medium that we yeah. used, it wasn't until iTunes came out and you're like, wow, I have my iPod and I plug it into my computer and I can download 99 cents for a song right, yeah. and put it in there. Well, now that's changed. Now you pay 10 bucks a month and you get access to any song you want globally. I mean, it's just, it's, you have access to everything. Yeah. And so near map is taking that subscription model or that as a service model mm-hmm. and applying it to an industry that people hadn't thought of. And that is GIS and aerial imagery yeah. and saying, Hey, we can update your data and you can have access to all of this information. And yes, while you're paying for it on an annual basis, it's typically dramatically reducing the cost or taking what you were spending and giving you two, three times uh, the amount of data or, yeah. you know, anywhere from two to four X the resolution that you were used to. No. And it's, there's, it just takes so much off the, the customer too, having to have the storage, um, having to have the capability to, to access the data and see the data for the previous flights, having worked in yeah. local government and okay, we've got imagery that goes back this far and, and you can, and you can go back to the furthest one and it's, awful (laughs) because the resolution is so bad on it and you're like well i need to compare this to this and you'll you'll take the current imagery which is a little better probably not the greatest again because of all the things that you mentioned regarding cost and how um local governments have to go about getting this data and you'll you'll be trying to do analysis from the past imagery to the the current imagery and it's almost impossible to do it just because of how bad it is and at the time yeah. it was great, but with, and, <laughs> and so you're, you, you need the space, you need to store all that stuff. 
files were bigger back then. It's it takes forever to load that stuff. And with the system you guys have, it it's really neat because you guys have your not only are you providing the data, but you have that viewer that you guys have, and you make it so easy to to do everything. <laughs> We if you haven't to. noticed, I'm definitely a fan of your map. So. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. We, you know, to touch on that point you brought up with storage and things, mm -hmm. uh, we we work through Amazon Web Services currently. We occupy, I believe, two to three petabytes of data on their servers, uh, a massive amount of information. And part of the reason that that data storage is so large is because we don't delete old captures. We maintain them in the cloud uh, so that you can more easily call up those historical images and run those comparisons uh, more easily. And so in places where we've been flying for many, many years, let's, let's say Sydney, Australia, you can go back as far as you know, 2008, 2009 and see all of the historical collections. And down there, because the sun and the, the climate is so much more conducive to collection, uh, we actually fly anywhere from four to six times per year. Oh, and wow. so all of those, yeah, all of those collections, which are sub three inch resolution collections, all of those are maintained in the cloud and readily and easily uh, accessible to you. Uh, and so that's, it's a big advantage being able to be cloud-based. Uh, we then combine that with being, for example, an Esri Gold partner, uh, one of a relative short list globally, Mm -hmm. uh, and we can integrate into, you know, their portal, you know, their enterprise suite uh, through AGO or, or within ArcMap, uh, for example. So it's not just that you can pull us in through the viewer, but you can integrate us into existing applications. So, and that's an advantage of us focusing on being a content provider. Part of being a content provider is finding the best, most streamlined, easy to use path for you to be able to use the data. And that usually happens through something like an API, that, that web connection. So we've put a lot of focus and development and effort on doing that. And then peeling back that onion a bit, going into your, your comparison and, and change detection and analysis, what we've begun to do is to say, okay, what else can an image pixel tell us? And how can we take things like computer vision and, and artificial intelligence and extract the inherent knowledge and value from those pixels. You might, you might know where I'm going with this, but NearMap has launched uh, our, what we call our AI product, which is essentially our data science team has developed advanced algorithms to allow us to automatically extract building footprints, vegetation layers, impervious areas, even detecting things as granular as, as like a light pole or power lines uh, and things like that. And the, the general rule of thumb with that is if you can, if you and I can sit down and say, you know what, that's a manhole cover. And we both agree, we can accurately circle manhole covers. Yeah. We can train the model to do the same thing. And because near map data is all collected at the same resolution everywhere, the algorithm, that's one less thing to have to take into account with the algorithm. Yeah. And that's an advantage to local government and, and other users as well, because as you'll know, working with counties, for example, hey, you know what, we can afford to get, you know, like four inch resolution in our urban areas, but everywhere else, you know, let's just do nine inch. Yeah. Well, if, if you're trying to do an analysis, that, that's some dramatically different data, especially for a computer to manage, looking at those different image qualities. But with near map, because it's all the same resolution, it can automatically chunk through that data. So we did our initial run uh, of the entire US and Australian footprint on just 12 attributes. And we did that in about two and a half weeks. So that was, I wanna say over 1.5 million square kilometers of content that it chunked through and extracted that data. That's insane. Uh, yeah, we, we forgot to tell Amazon we were going to do that. And so we, <laughs> we actually crashed AWS globally for a little bit because exactly. we spun up, I think, over, over a thousand CPUs or something at, at once oh my gosh. Uh, to, to run that analysis. And so needless to say, our account manager from AWS called and said, uh, we need to increase your plan. And he probably had a pretty good Christmas uh, with that commission check. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's that it's the 
just that power of cloud computing. And the message I share with a lot of GIS people is it's okay to trust the cloud. You know, Esri is pushing there. Uh, yeah. Arc map, rest its soul, will be deprecated soon, <laughs> you know, and, and things will be migrating to that. And that's where the future is, is having that data stored there. And it unlocks I mean, you say that, people. but there's definitely people who in 20 years are still going to be using Arc map <laughs> because you they're going to refuse that, to go forward. <laughs> And, and that's okay. There's still people that bust out a typewriter here and there and, you know, <laughs> bless them. But you know what? There, there will always be some needs because sometimes and I see this in the industry a, a lot. I get this question often. Well, you know, it's this question around, well, if it's a subscription and we don't own the data. And I say, look, here's what we can provide you. We can still provide you an offline copy. That's going to be dramatically better than any other copy you got before because it's a higher resolution. For sure. Uh, and you can maintain that. So there will probably still be a need to have uh, offline data in some fashion. That's I don't foresee that going away just for local government purposes. Or perhaps it augments into some sort of uh, perpetual license that is very, very cheap. Uh, if for whatever reason the, the, the ongoing updated relationship isn't maintained. Uh, we can do that. We can certainly fulfill what we call those legacy requirements, but we also want people to know where Esri is headed and where Arc Pro uh, and AGO is. We have already been for a while and the content's already ready in there and it can perform faster. Uh, even I, I sat down with a GIS analyst at the city of Indianapolis and I said, let's do a test run. And he loaded you know, his local image through their internal server. And it ran markedly slower than when he connected uh, near maps and base map through AGO, uh, just through a standard WMS connection. Uh, so it, it has a lot of benefits, but we're trying to meet that middle, at least for the public sector to say, we can provide way more than you ever had before. But we can still cross off those needs for you know, a public facing image, uh, offline data that they can maintain, things like that. Nice. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode. Join us again in a couple of weeks for part two, where we talk about some of the things Brett learned in sales and how they can be used to boost your career in GIS. From selling your spot at the table to how to get buy-in from other departments. <laughs>